record. So we were talking about entropy changes um, and different ways of finding them through all of these derivations, which like I said, I'm not, I wasn't too concerned with you knowing the derivations per se, just that know that it was done and that we ended up with equations that we can use using a certain number of assumptions, right? So last time we did 6.3 and 6.4 and then we very quickly touched on 6.5 because I wanted to give you a question rather than just, you know, keep talking about derivations. So we did this, we did this first one and we ended up doing this question right here. So we did this question right here, uh, which was entropy change of an ideal gas, right? Does everybody remember this, hopefully? So we did this. So then, uh, the next thing that we have to do is, it's this next part, which is assuming constant specific heats of uh, uh, doing the exact same process, but assume constant specific heats. So what constant specific heat assumption means is that essentially, like, let's say we have, uh, obviously we have two temperatures, right? We have two temperatures, T1 and T2. Now, if you guys go and look in the tables for specific heats, you will find that at varying temperatures, specific heat does change, right? So, I mean, you can show this wherever it shows you specific heats. It looks like A20, I think. Yeah, A19, we'll go to there. And I'll show this because, like I said, it's sort of important to know where it comes from. So, like I said, though, it changes. It changes with temperature. And so we are assuming constant specific heats, um, but obviously that's not actually the case, right? Specific heats do change. And so, it's so like for example, let's look at air here. Air, let's say our base temp our base one is 300, and we're doing, because remember our last question was 300 uh, Kelvin to 1000. So you can see that this specific heat changes from 1.005 to 1.142 over the course of this, right? And you guys might go, well, that's not a whole lot, right? Well, it is, right? It is a pretty significant margin to be different by. And so we, whenever we say constant specific heats, what we are making the assumption is, we are making the assumption that the specific heat that we are given or the one we are choosing to use does not change. It's sort of like a, uh, it's like a quicker calculation version essentially like if obviously we know it does change but uh we're just picking one right we are picking a specific heat and it has to make sense right like um, usually if you're going to pick a specific heat to represent a big temperature change such as 300 to a thousand you would pick something in between right so you take this value and this value and you divide it by two right you add them up and divide it by two and you get a specific heat somewhere in the middle but for more in depth purposes, you would use both of them. But we are only looking at using one here because this is the assumption. This equation is making the assumption that the specific heats are constants. They are not changing with temperature or pressure or anything like that. So you have to immediately think of that. You have to go, okay, with these equations, we are treating them as constant, which is which is good, right? I mean, that means we we have an assumption that we are making that's going to help us, right? So let's look at this. It says, when the specific heat CV and CP are taken as constants, the previous equations, 617 and 618, which we can go look at really far back up here. So right here, when these are taken as constants, so essentially what meaning you can pull them out of the integral, right? Uh, we get down to here, right? And this is, this is after everything went, went down, right? This is the equation we're looking at. This is the one that we want. Essentially, CV and CP are going to be some number, right? Joseph, you got a question here? Before we continue. <laughs> Sorry, your cat is on your keyboard. Wow, that is a new one. So, essentially, whenever you see this right here, and if you see in the question, it says assume constant specific heats or something, this is the question we, we're looking for you to use, right? Or this is the equation you're looking to use, okay? Assume constant specific heats, this is what we're looking at. 
And so it says, these equations along with equations 3, 5 and 3, 5, 1 giving U and delta H respectively are applicable when assuming the ideal gas model with constant specific heats. Okay, so here we are. Now it says, let us determine the change in specific entropy in kilojoules or kilogram of an I air as an ideal gas. So I will go ahead and pull up a paint. We're getting an early question today. So early question today, and I will be asking you guys how to answer it because you guys have all the answers. I do not. Maybe we can ask Joseph's cat for the answer. If it's anything like my cat, it'll be pretty useless, but all right. So it says, let me pull this over here. Text tool, and in we go. So it says, we have temperature one, so we are we have to determine the change in specific entropy. Let me roll up here. Determine the change in specific entropy of uh, a temperature. So we have T1 is equal to 300K, right? And it says pressure one, so P1 is given as one bar. And then it says T2 is 400K. Now, obviously, if you guys remember looking at that specific heat chart, you guys would know that it does change between those two. Not by a huge significant margin though, right? Like you guys notice that from 300K to 1,000, it only went up by like, you know, uh, 0.15 or something really tiny. But in between those two temperatures, it wouldn't go up by anything huge, but it does go up. That That is important to make a distinction there. It does go up. So that means it would be slightly inaccurate to assume that, but it won't be hugely inaccurate, right? So P2 now is five bar, okay? And it says, for, an, for air as an ideal gas undergoing a process, because of the relatively small temperature range, we can assume a constant value of CP evaluated at 350. So this is what I told you, is that you can pick a CP value in between the two temperatures to represent a uh, sort of a linear part in between them, right? Like obviously we know uh, I think you guys could probably make you guys could probably figure out that you don't do you think CP is a completely linear expression that as one thing changes one thing changes equally <clears throat> do you guys believe that no it's not it is not it is not completely linear like those tables in the back when we use linear interpolation on them that's not exactly right either uh, it doesn't come up with the exact right thing, but it gets you close and closer to the real answer, right? So it is not a completely linear expression. And so that's why we're, it doesn't, we're going to use it. We're going to treat it as such, but it isn't. And it's important for you guys to know that, that it is not, it is not completely linear, but we're going to do it here because it makes more sense than using 300, right? Like for example, if we use the CP at 300 and use that exact same P CP for a temperature of like 500, does that make sense? No, the ant, that doesn't make sense. But using one in between them, just one value in between, that makes more sense than picking 400 or 300 CP and just going with it, right? So we're going to do that. So we're gonna do CP, and I'm gonna go ahead and go back to the tables here, because uh, we are there. So this is air, if I recall from the question, make sure I said that right. Air is an ideal gas, I see, I see. So if we went to air here and we did 1.005, and we went to 400 and you did, um, 1.013. So the difference in between these two is uh, what eight looks like, or 0 0.008. So that means uh, what you would pick a value of in between there. So it would be what uh, 1.009. Let's see if that's what they did. Okay, so they picked 1.008. Wait, at, oh yeah, <laughs> it's halfway in between. <laughs> I could have just done that. But yes, right here. They've done that. I just did it the old fashioned way. I didn't even look at the middle one. I just did this plus that divided by two and you'd get the one in the middle. Although you would get 1.009 if you did it my way, but that's whatever. We'll go ahead and use their value, which is 1.008. At least I think that's right. Am I right about that? Oh, man, dude, I might be talking nonsense. It's a Wednesday, guys. Got to pull up the calculator just to be sure I'm not completely out of my mind here. <laughs> Someone in here is about to tell me that I'm out of my mind. Nope, okay, I was right. Never mind. 
Okay. I am in my right mind for today. So 1.008, and this would be kilojoules. Uh, what is this in? CPs are in what? Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin. Gotcha. Okay. So this is what we were given, right? So let's go back to the question. It says that we need to find the uh, delta S, the change in entropy, given these conditions. So can somebody tell me? Let's ask Joseph or his cat. What do we do first? Joseph's cat, tell us. How do we do this? And if he's not here, we're going to Tanner. So I'm going to give you a help. You, so you're here, but you don't know. Okay, so maybe the, this help right here, me drawing a big circle. Use that equation. Okay, you are right. Okay, I agree. So, but which one though? Ooh, which one, which one? Which one is, which one can we use here? The pressure one, I agree. So, what we need to do is, we need to use this equation right here. Okay? So this equation. So, we need to go ahead and write this into our, our you know sheet over here, right? So I will go do that. So let's go down here. Let's write this equation. So this will be the equation we use. And like I said, this is how your question should start, guys. This should be the equation for the question. So I don't know how you ever want to write it. Just I'm just going to say equation. So we would have S, uh, this is going to be 2 prime minus S1. Or no, no, this is a prime. This is S2 minus S1 is equal to. And this would be CP times ln of T2 over T1 minus, and let's move this over. R. Now, if we want this in terms of uh, <clears throat> of kill, we want this in terms of mass at the end. So this R is going to have to be divided by something. So we're just going to call this one R, not R bar. So R times uh, ln of P2. Although I think it's CP ln. If I'm right. Oh no, it's not. Okay. It shouldn't be. That's right because it only goes with this one. Okay. So this is our equation right here. So out of all of these things, what do we have? Well, we're looking for this, right? We have this, we have this, we have this, we have this, and we have that. So what we need is R, right? We need R in terms of uh, mass. So you guys already know this one, but we're going to head ahead and quiz you anyway. What is the molecular weight of, ma of air? Ooh. 28.97 is correct. So I'm going to go ahead and start writing this thing in here. So let's do 1.008 times the natural log of T2 over T1, which is 400 divided by 300. Okay? So I'm going to just write in everything we know. And then we have R, which we're going to do 8.314 divided by 28.97. Because once again, we use the ideal gas constant divided by 28.97, which is our molecular weight of air. And then we multiply that by the ln of P2, which was 500 or 5 bar. It'll be the same, whichever way you do it, and divided by 1. So this is what we have so far, and this is an answer, right? We are going to get this now. Let's see if second, so I actually brought my other calculator today, the one that can do interpolation. So, calculator is here on two accounts. So 1.008 times the natural log of 400 divided by 300. All right, minus 8.314. I know you guys, this is like really interactive for you. Just hearing me type through it times the natural log of 5 over 1, so 5. So I got, let's see, what. so I got 2.14 something. Let's go see if that's right. 
So that was not right. What did I do? Did I subtract it? Answer April 34. What did I do? Okay, let me see. I may have to do it a little more carefully this time. But we shall see. So 1.008 times. I highly suggest you do these things by parts, by the way. Uh, because if you don't do them by parts, uh, you can of oftentimes make mistakes. Like, I, I think I figured out what I did already. I have a way different number than I did last time. Yep, all right. So my answer is negative uh, 0.1719, and that is what they have as well. So we have gotten the right answer. So yeah, I think what happened was is, is that uh, it's a little dark in my room, and I think I might have typed 40 instead of 400. So we got a little bit of a different answer. But like I said, make sure if you're gonna, if you do like a long equation such as this, make sure you do it by parts. Uh, because you do this one, write down the number, then do this one, write down the number, and subtract it. Because it can oftentimes make a mistake on your calculator. All right, so we have done this problem. We have gotten the right answer. So, like I said, for constant specific heats, if it says air is an I, uh, if it says, um, you know, constant specific heats, you look at this these equations right here. Uh, did the entropy decrease? Uh, yes. Um, so entropy, so I think, so delta S, we're actually about to talk about this. So I'm glad, I think, I think we're talking about it today or the next day. So delta S can be negative. Entropy produced cannot be negative if that makes sense. You can't, yeah, so that's the distinction. So delta S, so like our entropy can change, right, because of some process. Uh, and it can go, uh, S2 can be uh, less than S the initial. That can happen. Uh, but it cannot be where sigma, which is representative of entropy produced, cannot be negative. So for example, uh, I'll put this in like, you know, uh, you know, like conceptual terms. Uh, entropy produced cannot be negative if we go through like a turbine. Like think about it this way. If we if I run a bunch of like steam through a turbine and it just crashes against the blades and there's frictional losses and all types of losses, um, we cannot we cannot lose entropy, right? Because remember entropy is a kind of a measure of order, right? So we cannot ever go we cannot ever go back to where we started and i think i mentioned this when doing like a ts diagram and you'll see these as we go on but how they look for Rankine cycles is which is power cycles how they generally look is something like this as state one this is before the turbine this is the isotropic state which means that s1 is equal to s2 and the uh the real state the one that actually is a real life turbine with some efficiency comes in over here somewhere and this is 2s and 2 and so basically what I'm saying is that it is only possible to go in front of that line you can either go perfectly straight down entropy 1 is equal to 2 or you can gain entropy entropy gained right you know from the process but you cannot go back this way from like a from like a turbine compressor things like that it's not possible Hopefully that cleared her up a little bit. But we will, we we actually are going to be dealing with that in just a second. Uh, we're going to skip the computer retrieval of data because we don't have computers to really, okay, you got a computer obviously, but you know, you're not gonna, we don't have the software, so we're not gonna do it. All right, so now we are starting something else, which I think is actually we're about to get to you right here, where you were talking, look at this. Isentropic process. We were just we were just talking about you. 
So it says entropy change in internally reversible processes of closed systems. So now we're back on closed systems, okay? Not open, so closed systems. So it says, in this section, the relationship between entropy change and heat transfer for internally reversible processes is considered. The concepts introduced have important applications in subsequent sections of the book. They really do. Big section, guys. Big if true. The present discussion is limited to the case of closed systems. Similar considerations for control volumes are presented later in 613. That's the big section, 613. As a closed system undergoes an internally reversible process, its entropy can increase, decrease, or remain constant. This can be brought out by using this equation. So ds, so ds can change either it so uh, it can either increase, decrease, or remain. So this is the uh, entropy change, right? So this is where we were just talking about entropy change can do all of these. So that says, uh, this can be brought out using this equation, so hold on to this one for a minute. It says, which indicates that when a closed system undergoing an internally reversible process receives energy by heat transfer, the system experiences an increase in entropy. Conversely, when energy is removed from the system by heat transfer, the entropy of the system decreases. This can be interpreted to mean that an entropy transfer accompanies heat transfer. The direction of the entropy transfer is the same as that of the heat transfer. In an adiabatic internally reversible process, so adiabatic meaning no heat transfer, internally reversible meaning the process has no like frictional losses or anything like that, entropy remains constant. A constant entropy process is called an isentropic process. So that little chart that I drew last time, I think they actually have a, uh, they might have a picture of it in a minute, but that little TS diagram that I drew like this, this right here where entropy remains the same is a uh, constant entropy process, which means that whenever I make the assumption like that, when I say uh, this turbine is isentropic, it means it has all of this accompanying it. Adiabatic, internally reversible, it has all of that. So when we say isentropic, we mean that it is entropy remains constant and it has all of this encompassing. It essentially is the perfect process. It is no heat transfer leaving, no no turbine losses through friction. We have like, you know, super well oiled, you know, uh, bearings and shafts and things like that. Everything is good. So that is what we mean when we say isentropic. So hold on to this one for later. Big definition. It's huge in the next class. So it says area representation of heat transfer. It says on rearrangement, equation 6-2B gives Q internally reversible is equal to TDS. So we've already looked at this equation just a little bit. And then it says integrating from initial state one to a final state two. So Q is equal to the integral of from one or from uh, one to two of TDS, right? So then it says from equation 623, it can be concluded that an energy transfer by heat to a closed system during an internally reversible process can be represented as an area on a temperature entropy diagram. Figure 6-4 illustrates the area representation of heat transfer for an arbitrary internally reversible process in which the temperature varies. Carefully note that the temperature must be in kelvins or deg uh, degrees, Rankine. And the area is the entire area under the curve. Also note that the area representation of heat transfer is not valid for irreversible processes as will be demonstrated later. Okay? So, this right here is what they're talking about. This is an is the shaded region, right? So that is the area under the curve, which is the heat transfer of the process, right? And so we're going to get into a little bit more of these diagrams in a little bit, and they'll make a. I think we we already have a little bit though, uh, but we'll we'll get into it a little bit more very very soon. So then we have the Carnot cycle application. <laughs> so now we're back to the Carnot cycle. So it says, to provide an example illustrating both the entropy change that accompanies heat transfer and the area representation of the heat transfer, consider figure 65a, which shows a Carnot power cycle. The cycle consists of four internally reversible processes uh, in series, two isothermal 
and two adiabatics. So you guys remember this, right? We did talk about this, where uh, the Carnot power cycle is, in fact, actually all of them are made up as that. They're either two isothermal or two adiabatic, okay? It says in process two to three, heat transfer to the system occurs while the temperature remains constant. So right here. So we're looking at that. So it says, like I will reiterate, in process two to three, heat transfer to the system occurs while the temperature of the system remains constant. So right here is where we're at. At TH, so the hot temperature. And then it says the system entropy increases due to the accompanying entropy, entropy transfer. For this process, equation 623, Q23 is equal to TH, S3 minus S2. So area 23, so 23A, B2, yeah, it's, a, it's really, you, you're going to basically like look, you have to like follow these a little bit, but yeah. So 23A, and then B, A, and then it's B2, which is like here. Yeah, like, like I said, this this is actually a confusing way to do this one, but <laughs> uh, I don't know how I really like how this is right here. So it says on figure 65A represents the heat transfer during the process. Process 3 to 4 is an adiabatic internally reversible process and thus an isentropic process, constant entropy. So what it is saying is the following. These two processes are isentropic because, as you noticed, entropy at A and at B from 1 to 2 it's the same and from 3 to 4 it's the same okay so these are constant entropy processes uh, but really fast heat transfer so I, I'm gonna say this uh, heat transfer processes are never uh, constant entropy like there, there's no way for you to, to give heat into a system or remove heat from a system without entropy changing. So uh, whenever we say, whenever I say isentropic process, it usually means something like a turbine, a pump, a compressor, things like that. It has to be some like mechanical process because heat transfer processes never are rever never are reversible in that sense to where you can have entropy one equal entropy two if entropy one equals entropy two and you're doing heat transfer it means you didn't transfer any heat it, mean, it really it literally means that the first temperature is the same as the next one you've done nothing all right so then it says once again a prostitute four is a back and return reversible process four one is in isothermal process at TC during which heat is transferred from the system. Since entropy transfer accompanies the heat transfer, system entropy decreases. So right here you can see from uh, 4 to 1. So we went, we went from A here to B and we lost heat here. We have lost, uh, or actually, yeah, yeah, we've lost heat here. It depends on how they're actually num. So the problem is it's hard. It's hard to know because they. This is like a. This is like a, a boat kind of a system that's like made up. I don't know what processes actually accompany these, but I can guess. Um, this right here, in an actual power cycle, would be a. Uh, this right here would be the condenser. So this would be the lake water, like running through the condenser and taking away heat. Right here. Would be. Uh, I guess, man, so I guess it's hard to say because of how they've drawn it, but essentially you can, I think this right here would be like a pump of some sort. Yeah, this would be the pump. But anyway, what I was going to say is, is that the pump right here is isentropic and so is the turbine stage, which is three to four. So that's what we have isentropic, isentropic, and then isothermal is here because they're staying the same temperature. So, like I said, this is going to be a lot of work here, a lot of thinking, but it says, well, we'll continue a little bit. So it says process one to two, which completes the cycle, is adiabatic and internally reversible, so isentropic again. The network of any cycle is equal to the net heat transfer, so the enclosed area one, two, three, four, one represents the network of the cycle. The thermal efficiency of the cycle also can be expressed in terms of areas. So, essentially, what it's saying is, is that the work cycle is 
the net is basically any uh, it's the net heat transfer added. So essentially it is this enclosed part right here. Right? Because the heat transfer leaving is here. The total heat is here. So if you subtract this from the added, you get the middle part, right? So, and then the uh, heat added is area from, what is this, two, three. So this right here would be, yeah, so essentially the heat transfer added would be this. It would be from the area under this part right here, which is what I said, the heat added would be here. but we don't really have to worry about it in integral form, right? We're always going to know these values of the enthalpies, right? You don't ever have to do this like weird area under the curve integral form. You just always have to deal with uh, H values and things like that. So don't worry, don't worry too much about this. Just know that uh, the area under the curve is representative of work of the cycle, heat leaving, and heat gain, right? So heat gain is this very top portion. This is heat added in the boiler. Heat leaving would be this part at from four to one because we're losing the heat here. And because if you guys remember, work is equal to Q in minus Q out. Obviously, if you take this total part and you subtract off this bottom part, what does that leave you with? It leaves you with this in the middle, which is the work of the cycle, right? So that is what we wanted to get out of that. Uh, let's see if we did this. Uh, and then it says that if the cycle are executed as shown in this next one, this is a refrigeration cycle. So this is a Carnot heat pump or refrigeration cycle, and it pretty much works the exact same way. Obviously, it requires power instead of making it, but it's still, you know, isentropic process from 2 to 3, 4 to 1, and then these are isothermal. It's the exact same way except that it works with power coming in, right? All right. So now it says work and heat transfer in internally reversible process of water. So now we are going to do another question here, okay? So we're getting a two for today, just to show you what we might be facing in the future. So it says, evaluating work and heat transfer for an internally reversible process of water. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get rid of this stuff right here and then we can continue and I'm expecting some, uh, I'm expecting a better thing than I don't know. I'm here, but I don't know this time, Joseph. So maybe somebody else will answer though, so you don't have to. All right, so it says, I'll just move this away. Eh. I always like to show you what I'm writing, but it's okay, Never mind. I'll just, re I'll read it and kind of move it off to the side. So it says, water initially, at saturated liquid. All right, so we're, we're back to the tables now, guys. We're back to the water tables. So we have water. So let's do givens. And we have water. And it says at saturated liquid. So that means X1 is equal to zero, guys. It's because saturated liquid. We are all the way on the far left of the uh, you know weird umbrella for the saturation curve. X1 is zero. We are at saturated liquid, which is really helpful. And it says at T1 is equal to 150 degrees C or 423.15 Kelvin. Uh, I'm going to write that because I'm sure we're probably going to need that in just a minute. They wouldn't have given it to us if you didn't. So then it says in a piston cylinder assembly, so we are a piston cylinder, it says the water undergoes a process to the corresponding saturated vapor state during which the piston moves freely in the cylinder. Okay. If the change of state is brought about by heating the water as it undergoes an internally reversible process at a constant pressure and temperature, determine the work and heat transfer per unit mass each in kilojoules per kilogram. So what that meant, so that, that was like a lot of weird ways to write this, but what that meant was essentially if we heat this up right here, so I'm going to go ahead and just put it back on the screen and I'll draw a little picture here, although I think, I think they have one as well but now I have to write some other things. So T2 is also equal to T1, because we're still in the saturation curve, and X2 is equal to one. So here's what we've done. 
really fast. I'll, I'll draw like a nice little picture here. Got to get some my my art in for today. So, what we have done is the following: is that um, we have essentially increased. So let, let me let me draw another. I have something else. I have to do a little bit more here. So let's do this. So there is our piston cylinder, right? Essentially what we've done is, is that we have heated it up, right? So what we did was during this process, we just heated it up. So let me draw this. So this is our state one and this will be our state two. So what we did was we heated it here. And over here it was just water, right? It was water. And then as we got over here, it is now vapor, right? It is water vapor now. Now let me see if that, they have a picture I'm sure. Let's see if I reverse the things. Nope, I didn't. So essentially I drew it in kind of like a weird, uh, this is like a very exaggerated way. Like the piston moved a lot higher in this picture, but like don't worry about that. What we have to know is, is that here it was water. So I'm gonna draw some water in here, right? And we added some heat until it became vapor up here, right? Just water vapor. And we stayed at the same temperature and the same uh, pressure as we did this, okay? All that changed was that we went across this curve. So once again, let me draw this curve. All we changed was, was the following. We went from here to here. This is state one and this is state two. So essentially what this question is asking is how much heat transfer did we have and how much work did we produce? That is what they want to know. Okay. So we had piston heat. Let me draw the rest of this. So is everybody kind of an understanding of like how this worked essentially? Why? So how it, how it was. So all we did was is that we heated up this water enough to get it to go from all liquid to all vapor. This is essentially what you do whenever you make mac and cheese and heat your noodles, essentially. This is what you're doing. You're taking the water and going from here to here. Except we did it in a piston cylinder and it pushed the cylinder up, right? So does anybody have any thoughts about how we should start this? Anybody? Anybody have some thoughts? Okay, so you're saying use the volume equation this time. So uh, I think volume does change. So think about it. This right here is the volume we're working in. Now it is here, right? So we do have to be careful there. So what, okay, so how about this? Let's, let's take a step back from those equations we looked at before. Don't, don't worry too much about concepts. We're in a new section now. What would we have done before had I given you this right here? What, what would you have done before? Okay, so you would look up V and U for each state, and you would also now, but remember, this is a chapter about entropy, so what else would you grab here while we're in, while we're there? You would grab S, I agree with you. So what we should do is we need to go to the table and grab these things. How much time do we have? Uh, okay, we're doing all right. So uh, let's go over here to the tables and let's go to water. So this should be water and we are at 150 degrees C if I recall. 150 C, 
Okay? So we're going right to here. All right? So here are where we are. So we need to grab a bunch of values here. And that doesn't mean we're going to need them necessarily. It just means that we're going to take them in case, right? So let's go ahead and grab this first one, which is saturated liquid value. So I'm going to pull this up, and I'm going to just type them in as I go. So hopefully you don't worry about that. So let's do V1 is equal to 0 0.001905, right? And this is in meters cubed per kilogram. Okay. Then the next one, you would go over to U sub F, which would be 631.68, if I recall, kilojoules per kilogram. U1. All right, and then the last one we're going to take is SF. So it's the saturated liquid value for entropy. So go all the way over here, and you would get the following, 1.8418. 1.8418. Okay, and this is in kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, okay? So we have now gotten all of state one's values that we wanted, right? So state one's values are all listed right here. We, we did what we wanted to do. Now there's one more thing though. So we, we've now crossed off the first state, right? We know if you've made it to this point in a question, you can move on. State one has been completed, right? Because we have everything we need to know about state one. And if we don't have it, we can go look it up, right? We've, we've gotten everything we need. So now let's try state two. So anybody have an idea of how we do state two? Anybody? The answer may shock you. So we have the exact same information about state two as we have state one. We know that temp the temperature stays the same, right? And we know that it goes to saturated uh, vapor. So that means we have everything we need to know about finding state two things as well. So we go right to the chart, and you would go right over here, and you would just grab all the same values but for saturated, uh, uh, for saturated vapor. So we go right through the exact same things again. So you would have saturated vapor value V2 is equal to 0.3928 meters cubed per kilogram. Then we have U2 is now the saturated vapor, which is 2559, 2559.5 kilojoules per kilogram. And then the last one is the uh, saturated vapor value for uh, entropy, which is 6.8379. So 6.8379. This is kilojoules per kilogram K. Okay, so now that I've done that one, we now have everything, we now have everything that we need, right? Everything that we need to do the rest of this question. So let me move this back over here. So it says we need to find the work and heat transfer per unit mass, okay? So how do we find the heat transfer of a, or the work of a piston cylinder assembly? How do we do that? Anybody? Pressure times the change in volume. That is correct. So let's start here. Let's make a new bubble here. Let's say work solution. So he says that we need work is equal to, so this would be work one to two, is equal to pressure times uh, V2 minus V1, right? So this right here is what he suggests that we do. And I agree with him. Uh, I think this is right. And so that means we need to first find pressure though. So what pressure are we at? What pressure are we at?
Anybody want to take a shot at this one? Oh crap, Mike. <laughs> I'm sorry, my my my, my uh, speakers weren't on. Try again. Stat pressure at 153 feet, uh, 4.758. Yes, we are at the saturation pressure because we are still under the saturation curve. We just went from quality of 0 to 1. So we are at 4.758 bar. All right? So 4.758. Let's go ahead and bring this up. So I'm going to go ahead and write this. P1 is equal to P2, which is equal to 4.758 bar, which is also equal to... Uh, times, we just need a times uh, 100, so 4.758 times 100. I know that's pretty easy to do, but we're just going to do it anyway. 475.8. And this is in KPA. And the reason why you do KPA is because I think it converts easier. So that's why I just left it as that. And so I might not do the actual math because we need to actually see this now because we're running out of time. But as you guys can see here, it is work per mass is equal to 4.758 bar times our change in volume, and then they multiplied by 100. Because you have 10 to the fifth up here, 10 to the third here, they divide out to get you 10 to the second, which is 100. So you get this answer, which is 186.38 uh, kilojoules per kilogram. So I can write that out really fast, but like I said, we are running out of time because I talk too much. So work one to two is equal to, uh, we'll just do 475.8 times our change in volume, which is 0.3928 minus 0.0010905, which was equal to 186, is that what it said? 186.38. 0.38 and this would be in kilojoules per kilogram all right so that's the work solution now we have to work on really fast uh, we don't have much time but what we'll do is we'll work on the uh, heat transfer solution so this will be heat transfer okay so this will be heat transfer so how did we do it in the past real quick how did we do it in the past Since we had the heat transfer, what could we have done? What equation could we have done to figure this out? It's like an energy balance. You gotta account for the energy. Yes, so you're saying that we could have done something to this number, Q minus W is equal to U2 minus U1? Yeah. About right? Okay, I agree with you. And honestly, uh, they do it a different way because they want to use the QD, uh, Q equals the integral of TDS equation. But I'm going to do it after you guys leave and see if you get the same thing. My guess is that you do. But here's what they do, since we don't have much time. They do Q is equal to the integral of TDS, right? And then if you obviously do the integral of that, you end up with Q per mass is equal to temperature times the change in entropy. And so this is that equation we saw previously up here. Uh, right here, done out. And when you do this out, you end up with the following. You get Q is equal to T times S2 minus S1. And that is the reason why they gave it to us in Kelvin earlier. Because remember, for this entropy to work, it has to be in Kelvin. So you do that. You would then do 423.15 times 6.8379. Eight three seven nine eight three seven nine minus one point eight four one eight, and you get two thousand one hundred and fourteen kilojoules per kilogram, which is what they have here, and what's what I just got. Now I'm actually yeah, ah so here it is. You can do it the alternative way. I knew it. I was like it's just, it's the same thing. So if you guys didn't want to use that equation up here for the entropies in here, which I know that they showed you how to do it because that was part of this chapter. It's an entropy chapter. But you can also use it using the normal balance here. And you would get that as well. So, uh, not a big deal. However you wanted to do it. But you get the exact same answer. Alright, 
So now that we've taken care of that, uh, we are done for today. Now the next one will be more entropy balances. So right here, the next time we're in the class, this is where uh, whoever I was talking to earlier, uh, Joseph, uh, this is where we'll get to you right here, where you were talking earlier about entropy change, entropy transfer from heat, and then entropy production from the process. And we will talk about these things more in depth and how thing, one things can be negative, the other ones can't, right? But I'm going to go ahead and stop.